My name is Barbara Hambling. I have written fantasy and media tie-ins and historical murder mysteries and all kinds of other stuff um, since the early 1980s. And I'm, I guess I would be best known to Star Wars audience because in the mid-90s, when Random House first started coming out with the Star Wars novels. I was asked to do two of them. One of them was, the first one was The Children of the Jedi, and then the second one was uh, Planet of Twilight. Mm-hmm. So that's my, that's my Star Wars claim to fame. And because in Children of the Jedi, there was a, um, there was a sequence of the book which involved the Gamorrean pig guards. Um, I was also asked to, this, this was, uh, for West End Games, because West End Games had all of the um, books about Star Wars for role-playing games. So I, they asked me, would I do the section on the Gamorrean pig guards, like I'd been there. <laughs> um, so I, my, my other claim to fame is that I, I got to write about Gamorrean life and culture. So we can say you're the expert on Gamorrean pig guards. Um at least I was in the 90s. There may have been someone who was more expert than myself by this time. That is Barbara Hamley, folks. So uh, some of the questions which we have been given, they, they range from talking about Star Wars and talking about the writing process. Okay. But the first question is a Star Wars-based question. So you mentioned how uh, Random House approached you to write Star Wars books. So um, how did they approach you to write you know, Children of the Jedi? And then what was your first reaction? Like, were you a fan beforehand? What, what was your initial reaction to uh, the request? Oh, I have been a fan since um, the first film came out in, was it 77? Yep. Yeah, I've been a fan since the first film came out in 77. How I got asked is I met Kevin Anderson at a fairly small science fiction convention just when he was putting together the first of the Star Wars, uh, Tales from the Star Wars Cantina. And they asked, would I do a story from that? And so I did a story of the Tales from the Star Wars Cantina. Uh, the story was called Night Lily. And um, let's see. So apparently at that time, Kevin mentioned to the editor who was in charge of the Star Wars novels line at uh, uh, at Del Rey Books or at Valentine Books, and apparently he mentioned this, and I guess she said, "Oh, I didn't know Barbara Hamley liked Star Wars," because I I already had a reputation as a fantasy writer. Mm-hmm. So she got in touch with me and said, "Would I like to do a Star Wars novel?" And I said, "I would be delighted to do a Star Wars novel." That um, definitely and that, has to be kind of cool. Oh yeah, I I was I was just delighted. Um, Strange that you mentioned Kevin Anderson because um, we had Steve Perry on uh, a couple months ago, and he mentioned how he first was introduced to writing books through Kevin Anderson as well. well for a while, when that first group of Star Wars books was um, was being written, Kevin was almost acting as an unofficial story editor for the book line. He was the one who, because, you know, as as those first books were being written, not everybody could keep track of all of the characters that were being created and all of the, um, the storylines that were being created in the books. And Kevin kind of kept track of that. So he was like the continuity person? To yeah, make he was, sure yeah, he was like a, a continuity person. Okay, so... Uh, well, another question from like, to build on that a little bit is with your first um, full book, uh, Children of the Jedi and then Planet of the Twilight, of course, it's, it's basically a sequel. What motivated you to come up with this storyline? And uh, were you influenced directly by the films or something else at that time? The storyline of Children of the Jedi, the editor at that time told me that she wanted to have this story be where Luke meets the love of his life. And I was delighted. I... Uh, I came up with the character of Callista, and 
I wanted to do a ghost ship story. I love, I love haunted house stories. I love ghost ship stories. So I came up with the idea of this disembodied spirit haunting the computers of a ghost ship. But the main thing that I wanted to do with the ghost ship story, it was a project originally designed like 30 years ago by the emperor, and it was going to go pick up groups of stormtroopers from various planets and indoctrinate them to the mission and take them to blow up some planet. But something went wrong, and the mission was delayed for 30 years. And so it's been going around to all of these planets, picking up groups of completely innocent aliens, indoctrinating them to think they're stormtroopers, and going on a mission that for an empire that no longer exists. And for some reason, this story just really entertained me. When, when, when you put it that way... You're right. It does make it sound a lot more humorous. Um, it's like, it's like you know what? Here, we're just going to pick up a whole group of people that have no idea what's going on. We're going right. to indoctrinate them, maybe give them a white helmet. Who knows? Kind of a fast Tus statement. Tuscan Raider troopers, Jawas. I, it was quite that, humorous. That, that, you know, I'm, I'm like making the visual in my head, and I'm just like, wow, that actually is kind of epic. <laughs> it, yes, it was epic. And... So Luke is, the other thing I wanted to do is I really like the character of Luke Skywalker. And since this is a very Luke-centered book, at times I feel that the presence of the Force, it makes for awkwardness in storylines. It limits the amount of conflict that can, uh, that can be produced in the storyline. I'm looking at it as a writer. And I thought, okay, the first thing we're going to do is Luke cannot use the Force. He has to use his wits. And this comes about because when he's picked up by this thing, he's injured. He's badly injured. And it is taking all of the Force that he can use simply to keep himself from going into shock and dying. So he can't... Oh, oh, oh he's, he's stuck there with 3PO. He can't use the force for anything else. And so he has to use his wits. And he's in this giant decaying battleship with these little pockets of completely confused aliens who think they're stormtroopers. And there's something else on the ship. There's some other spirit haunting the ship. And that spirit is Callista. And that was the origins of that story. So how did you go from Chilling the Jedi, which is like a haunted house type story with a lot of humor into it, to Planet Under Twilight, which is a very different type of story with a very different type of villain that, it, to me, was somewhat creepy. At least, um, what's his name? Uh, Drum, um, uh, Dramok? Dramok? Dram Can't remember that. The bug, the guy who, uh, has the bugs. No, in the, the, the giant bug. Well, I, the, the working title of that book was Planet of the Disgusting Bugs. <laughs> um, by that time, they had, even before Children of the Jedi was finished. I was informed that, no, in fact, Callista was not going to be the great love of Luke's life. Let's get rid of her. And I consulted with Kevin Anderson. At that time, I could not do a second book, but I would do the third book. So Kevin and I discussed what we were going to do with Callista. So that became one of the uh, subplots of Planet of Twilight. But the the... The, the main story for me is not the planet of Twilight. It's 3PO and R2 hitchhiking across the galaxy. That is true. <laughs> and for me, that was, the, that was the core story, and the other stories simply um, were it, – it's almost – it was like I was writing two novels. It's like I was no, – it was, it was like I was writing three novellas. The one about Leia, the one about Luke on this planet where if he uses the Force, it is going to have some completely unpredictable effect that might injure other people hundreds of miles away. So he does not dare use the Force. And the third novella was the one that I was having the most fun with, which was 
R2 and 3PO trying to hitchhike across the galaxy. <laughs> so what so what got you to come up with uh, as you said the the disgusting bug guy? Um I'm not sure where I came up with him. Exactly. Like, like, like a cockroach oh. infestation in your home that day and you're like, "Ah, yeah." <laughs> no. No, it was one of the things that I use a number of times in fantasy is either the irresponsible use of magic or the irresponsible use of technology. And, you know, you look at the way people breed and genetically manipulate food sources. And I thought, what happens if you genetically manipulate something so that it would be more delicious and instead, as a side effect, it became more dangerous. Wow. And that's, that's what these disgusting bugs started out as, is, you know, let's, let's genetically manipulate something to be tastier food, because we are talking about a hut here. Mm. Um, and it goes horribly wrong. And it goes and it horribly turned. wrong. <laughs> yep. Yep. But that's... Um, you know, it's it's one of the zillion varieties of a sorcerer's apprentice story. Is you you start out trying to do something, and you don't have all your facts straight, and you get a result that you were not expecting, and you can't do anything about it. That's very interesting, because like now that now that you mentioned about sorcerer's apprentice story and so on, it makes a lot of sense. Because I remember when I read that book the first time, my first reaction was this guy is kind of creepy and disgusting. Because it was definitely one of the darker books, um, at least among the earlier Star Wars ones. Oh, yeah. It was definitely one of the darker ones. And I was following it along for Callista's story, which brings me to another question. Um, I don't. Have you been reading any of the newer Star Wars books, by chance? Or do you no, know I have not. Them? No, I have okay, not. Because you know, in the recent books, in the recent Fate of the Jedi series, they brought back Callista. And I was just wondering if you're familiar with what they did with her in the recent books. You know, I've heard about that. Um, and it's... It's not what I would have done, but, um, you know, I, I read what her ultimate fate is, and that sounded fine to me. That sounded, you know, that's, that's how they concluded that they wanted to end her part of the story. I'm delighted that, you know, it really, it really warms my heart that I was able to create a character who provides a, uh, who is part of the, the greater Star Wars mythology now. Because, as, as, it, uh, as some people have said, Callista is the link between the old Jedi and the new Jedi. She is the last person who had the, the training and the instruction. And even though she can no longer deal with the Force, she can teach what she's learned. And I'm, I'm very pleased that I was able to add a character with that level of importance. Indeed, she was. She has been one of the most important ones because they reference her in a lot of books. They don't necessarily oh, have yeah. her in the books, but they definitely reference her. Oh, d dude, they reference her a lot. Because we know, of course, the love of um, Luke's life goes to Timothy Zahn's uh, character, Mara Jade, but Callista was there for a lot of the books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I have, like I said, it's not the story I would have told, but I have no problem with the story that they did tell. Okay. But I I have not had time to read the books. Do you, are you in contact with other um, of the Star Wars authors like Kevin Anderson and Timothy Zahn and I um, guess C. Perry Lucino and so on? I'm, let's see, I know Kevin. I know Aaron Alston. I think I've met Christy Golden, um, but I'm not in regular contact with them. Okay. So I guess one question, one, uh, one more question about Star Wars books, and then we'll move on to something else for a little bit and then maybe move back. So uh, if you were approached to write another Star Wars book, would you would you want to do it? Oh, yeah. Do you have any ideas where you'd want to go? Because I'm quite sure you've seen you know the movies and you've probably heard quite a bit on where they've gone. W is there any direction you'd want to go? Well, I have ideas that, um, you know, I'm much more familiar with the original cast rather than the... Um, the Prequels? Yeah. Yeah, than the, the, the sequel group. And... If I were asked asked to do another one, I would take as much guidance as I could from the editors because they have a much clearer idea of storyline. And, you know, uh, right now I'm not up on the storyline 
I would love to do another Star Wars book, but um, in order to do one, if I were asked, I would have to have a certain amount of conferencing with the whoever's in charge of continuity, and then whatever they told me, then I could weave a story around it. Writing has been my profession for 30 years. I can weave a story around anything. So you mentioned how you know, the continuity, and of course, with the editors right now, they have a hard job because if you've seen, there's been tons of Star Wars books out in the past few years. It's literally exploded. And so continuity is rather touchy. Yeah. And the further you go on it, the trickier it gets. Yeah, unless you go but, way early or way further in the future, it's, yeah, it's pretty hard. Yeah. A little bit more about yourself. Um, you've written a lot of novels. I've looked up quite a few of them. You wrote some uh, Sherlock Holmes novels. You wrote, or short stories, I should say. You wrote some historical ones. You wrote, is it the uh, Darworth series? Um, the Darworth series? Yes. Darworth yeah, series. Yeah. Why don't you share a little bit with the listeners about some of the novels you've written, why you like to, or like why you chose to write them, and some of the experiences you've had writing? Well, you know, being a writer... Mostly you just sit by yourself with a computer. It's There's not a lot of experiences with the actual writing part of writing. But writing historical uh, for many years now, because the fantasy market, because I started out writing fantasy, and the fantasy market kind of tanked in the late 90s. I believe because that was when you got online uh, fantasy gaming. Mm. And I think that just cut the fantasy market off at the knees. Although I'm told that the fantasy market is now starting to revive. But when the fantasy market kind of imploded, I switched over to writing historical uh, historical murder mysteries. And I love doing the research for those because I go, I go traveling. I go look at places. And I wrote a series, I, I am writing a series of um, vampire novels that take place in England and Europe immediately before the First World War. Ooh, and that sounds kind of cool. I think they are. I like that idea. <laughs> that definitely yeah. sounds like something I'd read. Well, the first of them is Those Who Hunt the Night. Second one is Traveling with the Dead. Then, then there was a long gap of time, and that series was just bought by a... British company, and I wrote a third one called Blood Maidens, which takes place in St. Petersburg in like 1911. Ah, uh, Muslim Rush. <laughs> I was mostly investigating the idea of in a city above the Arctic Circle, what do the vampires do in the summertime? <laughs> <laughs> I just, never thought be, that. Being from Alaska, I, I I definitely know what that's like. Have you ever seen yeah. Thirty Days of Night and so on? It can be really dark in the winter, but in the summer, it doesn't. The sun doesn't go down. That's so what right. was your so what was what your solution? Vampires do. So what was your solution? Oh, um, they did what the rest of the Russian nobility did was they left town and went down to the Crimea. <laughs> Leave town. There you go. <laughs> It sounds like a it's a simple explanation. Nobody ever thinks of that one. Oh, you, you know, got you it. Nailed it. Get out. Go, go on a vacation. Just take the coffin, warm, and move it to a warmer climate. <laughs> yep. yep. I like that. <laughs> yep. Well, also, St. I found out St. Petersburg would be awkward for vampires because it's built on a swamp and the water table is very high. So they have the same problem, a similar problem to what you have in New Orleans is – your cellar is going to be, you can't have a very deep cellar and it's going to be really damp. So I, I came to the conclusion St. Petersburg is a, an unpleasant place for vampires to live. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I had fun writing that one. So I have to ask, if you could humor me. Sure. Your vampires don't sparkle, do they? No, no. Thank Good. God. My <laughs> vampires are, it's kind of old style vampires. It's these vampires are people. For one thing, you know, every writer comes up with every vampire writer comes up with what are the rules for being a vampire? Yeah, like Anne Rice with Les Tad and. And in my view of it, the vampires they can't just drink a little bit of your blood and then let you go. It's not catch and release. Their power 
comes from absorbing the death of the victim. So they have to kill. And so the vampires are people who decide that, who have decided that they would rather kill other people than die themselves. Okay. So these are not people that you want to be around. That they're well. extremely dangerous, and they have psychic abilities. The older they get, they get stronger, and they have psychic abilities to influence people's minds. Because why else would you go down a dark alley with a total stranger? Yeah, really. That, yeah, I don't think that. I don't think people are have that little amount of common sense. There has to be some sort of foul play. <laughs> yeah, and the you know the vampires hunt by being very attractive, and the older ones can influence people's dreams. So, Ket, it sounds like you and I could be vampires. Probably. We can influence people's dreams, and we're very attractive. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank you for. So, you actually get to visit like St. Petersburg and all these places too, right? No, I did not go to St. Petersburg. Um. For one thing, one of the effects of the the market for fantasy and for other writing kind of tanking is that you get paid a lot less as a writer. So I have had to find part-time work, and I don't travel the way I used to. Traveling with the Dead, which was the second of the vampire books, took place in Vienna and Istanbul. And I did, I was able to go to Vienna and Istanbul. Oh, that's uh, cool. Oh, it was cool. I love Istanbul. I was just going to say, I've always wanted to visit there. It's, it's really neat. It was, it's really an amazing town. Um, but after that, I'm, well, actually, at one point in the late 90s and the early, early, uh, no, around, around 2000, between 2000 and 2005 or six, I did a couple of straight historical novels. Um, I did one about Mary Todd Lincoln. Uh, I did one about the the first four presidents of the United States and their wives, or in one case, his mistress. And then I did another one that was basically a, a novel about the home front during the Civil War. And I did travel a lot researching those, which was fascinating. I'm, I'm, one of my fields of study getting my master's degree was uh, early, early stages of American history. So being able to see all these places and experience some of helped you write them and understand the history better and appreciate it? Oh, absolutely. It. Absolutely. You... I find that seeing a place where somebody has lived tells me about that, that person. One of these books, it was called Patriot Hearts, and it was about Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, Dolly Madison, and Thomas Jefferson's black mistress, Sally Hennings. And from doing the Abigail Adams portions of that book, um, I was then able to turn around and, under a pseudonym, sell... Uh, Three murder mysteries using Abigail Adams as the sleuth. <laughs> so I have I have my three Abigail Adams murder mysteries. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. So so you mentioned how you did research for vampire novels and your historical ones. So when it comes to writing, you know, science fiction and fantasy, like what type of how do you do the research for those? Like how do you come up with different elements to to write those ones? Well. Um, Star Wars, that's one reason I loved writing for Star Wars, because, you know, when I agreed to do The Children of the Jedi, they sent me this cubic yard of stuff from West End Games, <laughs> of all the game books, all the, you know, all those planets of the galaxy that have only one ecological environment and one city per planet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah wow. Was, um, and... All the all the different spaceships, all the different weapons. So I didn't have to waste time coming up with that myself, because I, I could just say, Luke, 
you know, oh, Luke took a look at the engine and he said, oh, I see, this is a twin engine Hydrox drive. And I could just get that straight out of the, and its weaknesses are, uh, and I could just get that straight out of West End Games. You know, I'm not a techie. I didn't so it's kind of nice to have that, that then, is what you're saying. It's, it's yeah. nice when they send you all that material and it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. That's right. So my research on the Star Wars books was watching the movies and observing the characters very closely, observing their speech patterns, observing what is the kind of thing that Leia would do? What is the kind of thing that Han Solo would say? Trying to get the trying to get the characterizations as as on the money as possible. Um and then, you know, there's always research of things like, if you're stuck in the desert, what do you need to do to stay alive? If your ship has crashed in the – and this was before Man vs. Wild, so um, <laughs> I didn't have that resource. Um, now I do. A lot of research is things like, how long does it take to get from here to there? What are the, what are the problems involved? The, that whole sequence of uh, – C-3PO and R2-D2 hitchhiking their way through the galaxy. It was, you know, coming up with different planets they would end up on and what's going on on this planet and what's going on on that planet. With fantasy, with straight fantasy, which I'm in the process of put, pulling together uh, another fantasy project to see, well, has the fantasy market really revived? But uh, writing fantasy, a lot of it is, you know, figuring out how far can you go in a day on a horse? How long is it going to take you to get from here to there? That that type of thing. Okay, the, the, so the nuts and bolts. So the things that try to make your world as realistic as possible, so oh, yeah. that so that you know people aren't um, thrown out of you know the world, so they accept the reality that you try to give them. Yeah. Yes. It's, it is to make a. A non-industrial society, because we live in such an industrialized society, we don't even notice it anymore. And if you don't have artificial lighting, it becomes really important what phase the moon is in and when the moon rises, because it's really dark out there <laughs> if there's no artificial lighting. You know, how much can you see? And the answer is not a lot. <laughs> yeah, I was, was going to say, I don't think you're going to see much of anything. Unless you're a vampire. Yeah. Or yeah. that and, Riddick guy. <laughs> well, and the thing is, we've gotten so used to the the visual shorthand of movies and the visual shorthand of TV mm. that we think you can see outside at night. You mean you can't? <laughs> I wasn't aware of this. Everybody can in the movies. It's like, I didn't get the memo. <laughs> yeah. This this type of thing, this, things to make the world more real. And realism is always a good thing to have. Yeah. Well, the, the, the other thing about fantasy, about writing fantasy, is the more real the real stuff is, then you can drop in, you know, a dragon or um, magic and if all of your real stuff is spot on, then your audience is going to accept that dragon. That's true. That is very true. I remember the fantasy books that I would, I would read in the 90s. I remember the ones, like, to me, like, I remember reading them about, like, when I started to stop, I started to stop when uh, saturation, you know, when they started oversaturating. Like, I remember I used to read a lot of Forgotten Realms and, uh, what are they, Dragonlance and... Books like that, and once people started throwing things out there that made absolutely no sense in the world they were already creating, that's when I stopped because it, it got some of it got awfully ridiculous. Because there's like, um, okay, you aren't following your own rules anymore. Dragons yeah. are here, but okay, why do I care now? Yeah, you've got to follow the rules. You've got to follow. Okay, so we got a, a couple um, more questions for you. Sure. Um, one is, you know, also considering more about your writing, um. You've written a lot of different types of books, a lot of different types of characters, but like, what are some of the characters which you've had most difficulty writing, you know, trying to get into the mindset to write? And which type of ones do you find the easiest to write? Oh, gosh. Most difficult to get into their mindset to write. I'm trying to think of a character that I had difficulty in. Um... Well, maybe you could answer this one. 
Um, how were you able to get into the mind of, say, you said how, you know, you knew the Gamorian guards really well and you are able to write into them. How were you able to get into the mind of a Gamorian guard when, you know, it's not human and, uh, I don't think any of us have ever been a pig person yeah, before. Yeah, like, how do you figure out what, uh, uh, basically, for all intents and purposes, is a giant warthog on two legs? How do you figure out what they're thinking? Well, um, they have a very simple mentality. They're, you know, a lot of it is logical extrapolation. Is And, you know, uh, I wrote a short story for, um, I wrote a Callista short story for Star Wars Adventure Journal about a murder on the planet of the pig guards. It was called Murder in Slush Time. I think it's one of my best murder mysteries. Um, and it allowed me to do the Gamorrean guards. And my thought was, it's the it's the females who own all the property, and it's the females who make the society work. Because the men are just into fighting, and it's it's like I just imagine the entire planet. There's there's like the ratio is like the birth ratio would be twenty times as many males are born as females. Ooh, not good odds. So the females have a number of husbands. The females are the ones with the brains. The males are the ones who go out and fight. And it's like the entire planet is run by football teams. You know. Yike. Right. Um, That's kind of scary. (laughs) Yeah. Well, they're pig guards. Except during, during mating season, the, you know, then the males try to make themselves charming for the females. And one of the characters in this little short story, Murder in Slush Time, is he's a poet from some other, like, he's, you know, he's a human poet who's been stranded there and he makes his living writing love poetry. You know, during mating season, the males will come and hire him to write love poetry so that they can send it to the females. <laughs> hey, you know, it's a way to make a living. It's a good niche. It's thing. a way to make a living. That's uh, right. It works, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, you know, that's how I came to, who are these creatures, you know? And why would, why would one of them commit murder instead of just kill him in a fight? Why why would one commit, why would one commit murder by stealth instead of killing him in a fight? Well, and I guess to find out, we got to read the book. Yeah, but that does make sense, though, when you think about it. It really does, because if, but the way that, you know, you're saying how, like, with, uh, the whole, like, you know, uh, 20 to 1 type of ratio and there's a bunch more males and they're all in just gung-ho fighting and whatnot. It's like, by by doing that, it almost makes it seem like that's their nature to go straight forward. What oh, yeah. would make one yeah. of them go around that? Okay. That's right. That's, that's right. kind of cool. And, you I know, um, I'll have to check I'm, this out. Yeah, the, the story is called Murder in Slush Time. It was in... I think it was the August '97 uh, up, Star Wars Adventure Journal. Yeah, yeah, I, and you know, recently, like two years ago, I opened an area on my website because all of these old uh, fantasy series, is, even though they'd been dropped when the fantasy market imploded, a lot of people still really like those series. So about two years ago, I opened an area of my website where. I will write short stories about the characters from my old fantasy series and sell them using PayPal. And there's about 10 stories up there now. I I came to the price, they're charged five bucks, five bucks a story. I figured if you bought a magazine just for one story, which is why I buy magazines is just for one story, that's about what you'd pay for it. It's what you'd pay for a smoothie. You know, if you went to the beach and got a smoothie, you'd pay five bucks for a smoothie. And a short story is much better than a smoothie. Yeah. I hope so. And I would really like to get the right to put Murder in Slush Time on my website. And I wrote to um, wrote to Lucasfilms, and they said, we don't do that. So you will have to hunt down the magazine. Mm. You know, I think it's one of my best murder mystery stories. I'm really sorry I can't let, you know, I can't sell it on my website. 
Well, we all know how that goes. You know, maybe we'll just have to find go to Rebel Scum and ask Curdo if he knows where it is. Yeah, <laughs> the people at Jedi journals. It was the August 1997 Star Wars Adventure Journal. August 1997. Well, yeah. I'll have to go hunt that one down because I, I don't remember that one. I remember your short stories in uh, Most Eisley Canteen, I believe, was the one. And then your short, and then, of course, your the other two. And that's my childhood there. <laughs> well, my, one of, my favorite was the one about Jabba the Hutt's personal chef. <laughs> yeah, you know? I was dying when I, heard, when, I, when I heard about that book. I, th- I think the short story, I remember most of them tales from, like, I think it was Jabba's Palace, is the one about the Raincore Keeper. How he was, you know, raising his raincoat and how he loved the raincoat and how he's going to help it escape and then Luke kills it the day before they escape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's... You know, Kevin said he wanted to do them like all the characters that you see. And I said, the one person you don't see is Jabba's personal chef because he's hiding from everybody else because he is, he is scared to death of all of these horrible people he's associating with. <laughs> Plus, how how in the world would you cook for everyone in there? Because you look at Jabba the Hutt, what, what he would eat, everyone else would not eat. That's right. And so... Uh, That's got to be the most thankless job in the galaxy. You know, my I was married at the time, and my husband was really into cooking. And so the character of Jabba the Hutt's chef is directly based on my, my husband. <laughs> That's um, kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, his well, his the name of the character is Porcellus, which is Latin for a baby pig. And my husband's nickname when he was a hippie in Greenwich Village was Piglet. <laughs> That's cool. See, so interesting he, info. I like yes. that. Yes, so that that is Piglet. And you know, he was my husband was so much into you do this type of cooking and you do that type of cooking. And I thought, I'll give you a cooking story. (laughs) What did he think of it? Oh, he loved it. He also has a story in there. He did the one of the, um, those two guards who don't say anything. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) Except when they get back to their quarters, they have these long philosophical discussions. (laughs) Now that must be an interesting thing to sit down on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, his his uh, he was a science fiction writer named George Alec Effinger, and so he he has a story in there too. That's really cool. Yeah. So you learn something new every day. Okay, so I I guess um, we don't want to use up too much more of your time. So we have one question What's left that? to help wrap things up. Okay. We are grateful for for your time because you gave us quite a bit of very great information here. Um, so the last one is um, there's a lot of uh, aspiring writers out there, a lot of young people that like to write. Most of them write in the terms of fan fiction or role playing, you know, and so on. Um, our website actually has a lot of uh, role playing, like message board role playing, where you you write the stories and so on. So for aspiring writers, for people that want to that want to write, what are some like tips or ideas to help people become better at writing, or at least those who want to become uh, writers or want to co- create good stories, what what are some advice that you'd give them? Since you've come up, you've written a lot of stories, you've come up with a lot of different ideas. What advice do you give to those that are still on the bottom trying to get up? Um, first, I will say the professional market is really tough right now. But writing fan fiction, writing role playing stuff, that's a wonderful way to practice. You learn how to do dialogue. You learn how to set scenes. The advice I would give is every scene you write, try to make it do at least two things. You advance the story and you tell some more about the characters. You establish facts about the characters. Other piece of advice is if you get stuck, if you're writing and you you get stuck and you can't go forward, and this I got from my husband. He said, it's like you backtrack to the last crossroads. You know, you know how this, the story, you, you come to a crossroads in the story. Mm-hmm. And if you get stuck, you backtrack to the last crossroads and you go in a different direction. You know, that you, you, you're, you're stuck because you took the wrong path. Oh, let's, okay. let's go back and take a different path. So like for those of us who play video games, it's like when you mess up and you're like, I need to go back to my last save right now. Yeah. And redo it. Yes. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the other piece of advice I would have is always be willing to rewrite. Have somebody that you trust read this thing. And if it's not clear to them what's going on, or if it's not clear to them why the characters are doing this, be willing to listen to that, be willing to look at that, and be willing to rewrite. Oh, thank you for the thank you for the advice. I'm quite sure lots of people will will gladly uh, <laughs> gladly hear it, and it'll it'll help because uh, you can never have too much. Well, I guess you could have too much advice, but every you little bit helps. Advice. Yeah, you've got to pick your shoes. You know, yeah. you've got to pick your advice. Well, we'd like to thank you for your time. We'd like to thank you for all these wonderful answers you've given us quite a bit. And uh, from, from Bomb Bad Radio, we'd like to, to thank you. And, of course, you're always invited to be on anytime you'd like. Um, well, thank you. And if any time you're uh, thinking about writing again into Star Wars or get proposed for Star Wars, we'd love to hear about it. You know, I would love to write for Star Wars again. Um, but they, they have their own system of doing things now. And, um, you know, I got in touch with them and they said, you know, we're, we're doing okay. You know, they're, I found them easier to deal with than the Star Trek people. Really? <laughs> Hear that, Star well, Wars are better. <laughs> at the time, at the time I was writing for Star Trek, um, the guys at start at the Star Trek, they kept changing the approval loop. And so yeah. stuff that one group of people would approve Another and group the next would say, group of oh, people you can't would say things. you can't do that. Yeah, that's oh so, god, that had to be frustrating. It yeah, it was it was very frustrating. And I in comparison with that now they may have changed at Star Trek. Um but in comparison with that the Star Wars were so nice to deal with. Okay, well I will let you gentlemen get back to your evening. And, um, and we'd like to let you get back to yours. Okay. Thank you for this. And we hope you have an excellent day. Happy Valentine's Day. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. You too.